And one day the Belshim Tov came in to the king's house and he says, King, all the wheat has been blighted. All the grain that we're going to be bringing in this year has been infected with a fungus that turns people crazy when they eat it. And the king says, that's terrible, that's terrible. If I'm going to be the king and know how these people in my province are feeling, shouldn't I go crazy with them? But you and I will make a mark on each other's foreheads. So when we see each other later, we will know that we chose to go crazy, whereas everybody else is just crazy. See, it was my ambition to, uh, to really liberate the world. Uh, why not? I mean, why settle for anything less? Uh, and I have a sense of humor about it. I know the odds are against me, but uh, uh, we only have a few years here. Let's try to uh, leave this uh, spaceship a better place. In the 1960s, the CIA began Operation MK Ultra. They were trying to find the perfect mind control weapon through a psychoactive drug known as lysergic acid diethylamide, or LSD. The CIA knew very little about LSD in the 60s. It was invented in 1947 by Dr. Albert Hoffman. He found that it had a remarkable effect on the mind. The CIA thought they could keep the LSD phenomenon secret. However, its introduction to society inspired an entire generation of people who were soon to unite in a worldwide movement, a psychedelic revolution known as the 1960s. In this revolution emerged two men, two psychedelic pioneers. One was a psychologist, a Harvard professor, who became a radical thinker. One was an athlete, a wrestler, who became a famous writer. Both men led the same revolution and became more than allies. They became good friends. Hello, I'm Obi Babs. The 1960s was a time of consciousness expansion, questioning authority, and being in the now. Both of my parents were original members of the Merry Band of Pranksters, a group who drove a bus to the forefront of the 60s revolution. During their trip, they forged a unique relationship with Dr. Timothy Leary, the pioneer of psychedelics. Leary lived his entire life urging that you are the owner and operator of your own brain. In 1995, a year and a half before his death, Leary was diagnosed with terminal prostate cancer. But the news didn't slow him down. The grandfather of consciousness welcomed dying as the last frontier and ultimate trip. This is the story of Timothy Leary's last goodbye and reunion with Ken Kesey, 
his old prankster friend and psychedelic counterpart. Both men were revolutionaries, inspired by a phenomenon that arrived on the doorstep of the 1960s, a phenomenon known as LSD. The LSD is the most powerful substance that uh, the human being has ever developed for uh, influencing the mind. I've used the comparison of nuclear energy or a fissionable material. I think that uh, in the right hands and uh, with scientific and disciplined and uh, hopeful people, uh, it will bring about changes. Most people come back from an LSD trip and they say, there's only one word you can use. Wow. Timothy Leary had already led a full life before he discovered LSD at age 39. He was born in 1920 and grew up in a suburb of Boston, Massachusetts. Throughout high school, Leary challenged the philosophy, never do that which, if everyone does, will do harm to society. I don't have any advice for anyone. I'm just simply saying that we're going to be broadcasting our ideas of hope and confidence and of courage and uh, we don't say we're right but uh, God knows uh, we're, we're about ready for uh, for a new philosophy. Leary attended college at the West Point Military Academy in New York. This elite fraternity oddly became the breeding ground for the man who would become famous for the philosophy question authority and think for yourself. After challenging the authority of his superiors Leary was soon expelled. I would urge everyone, and that's one of my basic models, think for yourself, question authority with your friends, and uh, don't obey authority until you've thought it out and then you decide it that way. After Leary received his PhD in psychology, he accepted a job to teach at Harvard University. Leary was convinced Western psychology had become ineffective because it merely studied human behavior, but did nothing to change it. Uh, I see the, the United States and the human situation like a nervous system. We're all in touch. Uh, I think the problem has been that uh, we've gotten out of touch with each other. We've got to use technology to, to get into uh, uh, close communication. In the summer of 1960, on a vacation in Mexico, Leary had a life-changing experience. A friend introduced him to what the local Indians called the magic mushrooms. Leary suddenly found the answers he had been looking for. These psychedelic mushrooms had a powerful effect on the mind. He was convinced he had found the key to changing human behavior. Leary returned to Harvard with his research colleague, Dr. Richard Alpert. They had the psychoactive agent in the mushrooms called psilocybin synthesized into a small pill. Leary and Alpert's work at Harvard quickly elevated into an entirely new dimension. For the last six years, I have taken uh, LSD and other such drugs regularly. I consider it a part of my spiritual practice, just why we go to church once a week. I also consider it part of my scientific work. Uh, you can't study microbiological phenomena unless you look through the microscope. So I've used LSD about once a week for the last six years. At Harvard, Leary began research on the effects of psilocybin and LSD with students in his graduate psychology class. He and his students took the drugs together and analyze the results. I probably push my nervous system as much as uh, any human being living. I've taken LSD over 500 times uh, and I've experienced a, a wide range of uh, uh, these biochemical and uh, neurological uh, uh, possibilities. <laughs> I think I'm the strongest, sanest person around. The Harvard administration did not agree. In 1963, Leary was dismissed. It had been a century since Harvard had fired a professor, the last being Ralph Waldo Emerson, who was fired for telling students to leave the church and find their own God. Leary gladly left, claiming that his research was too advanced for the Harvard squares. Our avowed aim is, of course, to bring down the American empire. It's completely materialistic. It's completely devoted to the pursuit of automobiles and television and, uh, of course, metal and steel power throughout the planet. Leary was determined to continue his psychedelic work outside the rigid halls of academia. 
In 1963, he founded the International Federation for Internal Freedom, known as IFIF. Leary believed that internal freedom was the principle of having the liberty to travel one's own mind, one of the last frontiers of human discovery. In Millbrook, New York, millionaire Peggy Hitchcock let Leary use her family's estate to continue experiments with psychedelic drugs. Here Leary wrote The Psychedelic Experience with his colleagues, a manual describing how to explore the human brain through the magic of LSD. Leary and Ifif's new philosophy gained international attention. He called the LSD experience a trip, an adventure taken into the depths of the mind. His psychedelic retreat became a mecca of new understanding and consciousness. Artists and philosophers from around the world came to trip with Leary at Millbrook. William Burroughs, Allen Ginsberg, Jack Kerouac, and beatnik legend Neil Cassidy. Everyone came looking to find answers to all the questions. Then, one day, a man came posing questions to all the answers. His name was Ken Kesey. I came out of the University of Oregon, the, the, the prettiest little boy you've ever seen. I didn't uh, smoke, I didn't drink. I went to Stanford on a Ford uh, Foundation Fellowship. And while at Stanford, I was uh, given the opportunity to go to the Stanford Hospital and uh, take part in the LSD experiments. Ken Kesey grew up outside Eugene, Oregon. He was an all-star wrestler in high school and college. He studied the creative arts and acting. Kesey then attended the graduate writing program at Stanford University. To support himself in school, he volunteered to be a human subject in secret experiments that were part of the CIA's MKUltra operation. At the Veterans Hospital in Menlo Park, California, Kesey was given a plethora of psychedelic drugs, specifically LSD. The experiments were held in the hospital's insanity ward, giving Kesey the inspiration to write the famed novel, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. But Kesey wanted a medium more powerful than the written word to inspire society. He and his friends united to be known as the Merry Band of Pranksters. While Leary called his group If If, each of the pranksters had their own names. One in particular, my dad, Ken Babs. Hey, it's the Intrepid Traveler here. We from the West Coast, we're known as Is Is. That's the intrepid search for uh, inner space. My mother, Paula Sunston, was also a merry prankster. Her name became Gretchen Fetchin the Slime Queen. Ken Babs also attended the graduate writing program at Stanford with Ken Kesey, where their lifelong friendship began. Soon after, other friends joined up with Kesey in what would become the most legendary adventure of the decade. And we were on the beach at a place called San Gregorio in California. And that's also the night that the Merry Pranksters, as such, were born. That's when Ken Babs uh, started referring to us as the Merry Band of Pranksters, intrepid traveler as Merry Band of Pranksters. And we were tripping, went outside, and there was a tree full of fireflies, just twinkling like mad. And we stood there, kind of the tree, and suddenly those fireflies all begin to twinkle in time with each other. Pong, 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 because that was the vibe we were getting on, and uh, those fireflies says, hey, let's join in. In the spring of 1964, the pranksters bought an old school bus and painted it in psychedelic colors. The plan was to travel across the country, looking to discover new realms of consciousness. The name of the bus and its final destination was Further. For the trip, the pranksters brought along a 16mm camera and shot thousands of feet of film in what would become the world's first psychedelic movie.
Like Leary, Kesey and the Pranksters were eager to discover how LSD altered consciousness. The news of Leary's radical research had already spread to all corners of the world. Tim was obviously famous. You know, Tim was obviously famous. I mean, he's written many books. He was the man. He was the man in front of the LSD movement. You know, Kesey was a big man in front of it. But Leary was the man. He's the guy that really... Turn on, tune in, drop out was, you know, major major headlines everywhere. People were terrified of him. The straight people were terrified of him. And they, they, he was very big impression on, on, on the youth at the time. If anybody was, and he'd hate me for saying it, he was the messiah of the movement. At Millbrook, Leary held psychedelic sessions with small groups of people. Kesey and the pranksters had an entirely different idea. Out in San Francisco, Ken Kesey and his group, who's <coughs> very democratic, it's called the acid test, and there'd be a thousand people. When we heard that at Harvard, a thousand people, how could it possible? Ken Kesey having a thousand people dancing naked with the breakthrough of lead in San Francisco using LSD. Uh, no, I, I could see that that was going to uh, change public perception of it. What is going to be the theme of your uh, meeting? It's going to be a uh, graduation ceremony and a commencement exercise, uh, essentially for the heads. And uh, other people that would like to uh, know what the heads are doing. Are you going to tell what's bad about LSD? Not necessarily. Uh, uh, will LSD tell what's good. be in evidence uh, at the graduation ceremony, Ken? Um, why don't you guys come? Yeah. <laughs> Kesey and the pranksters posed a question to the psychedelic community. Can you pass the acid test? Kesey was really good with words. This, this is one of his things. The, the notion, the name, the acid test, was something that he came up with. Uh, the idea was, you know, we're gonna take acid. We got a bunch of it and we were doing these events where we'd all just, a bunch of us friends would get together Saturday night, other friends would show up and we'd do whatever anybody felt like doing. You know, try to do something artistic, performance-wise. We'd try to entertain ourselves, you know, rather than uh, just stand around and be entertained by hallucinations. We were trying to actually do stuff. What the Merry Pranksters were doing was making a movie about whatever was happening in the now. They packed their projectors, microphones, wires, lights, and instruments onto the bus, drove to a rented hall, set up, and waited for the audience to arrive. But the audience soon learned they weren't there to watch the show, they were the show. It was called The Acid Test. In this scene of the prankster movie, my dad, Ken Babs, becomes the narrator. Well, this is the all pointed head again. Up in communication central. The debris has been cleared off the stage. We've taken a slight uh, break from the hectic activities. And during the milling around period, I see that the band has gotten their equipment together and everything seems to be operating. And with a little more relaxing atmosphere, everyone is settling back for some music. The music at the acid test was played by some friends in a San Francisco band called the Warlocks. They featured a harmonica player and singer called Pigpen. And a guitarist named Jerry Garcia. The Warlocks later became the band the whole world would come to know as the Grateful Dead.
they played their very first gig calling themselves the Grateful Dead at the acid test. And uh, it was one of those things that during the week, Jerry had come up with the name. We all thought, hey, great names. <laughs> On their bus trip, the Merry Pranksters were ultimately heading to New York City, but they also planned a special stop a few hours north. At the wheel of the bus was Neil Cassidy. He was a legend of the Beat Generation, along with his good friend and writer Jack Kerouac. In Kerouac's novel On the Road, the hero Dean Moriarty was based on Neil Cassidy. But Cassidy's real claim to fame came from driving the bus across the country with the pranksters. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, we must prevent that crime. Oh, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, we'll get there in the next of time. We don't need to get up either, we don't got to care or see there. We're going to be way, way tonight. No, I don't know, though. Yes, I think so, too, too. It's a coach. No, it's a moat. Uh, once more. The horns faded the western coast. But that I say it could, it would, it should, it could. With Neil at the wheel, the pranksters charged out of New York City and headed north to Timothy Leary's Millbrook mansion. Kesey's plan was to unite the psychedelic tribes of East and West. This day in July soon became psychedelic legend. Tom Wolfe wrote a book on the prankster's bus trip called The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test. On the Millbrook meeting, he wrote, Everyone was waiting for the great meeting of Leary and Kesey. Word came down that Leary was upstairs in the mansion, engaged in a very serious experiment, a three-day trip, and could not be disturbed. Kesey wasn't angry, but he was very disappointed, even hurt. It was unbelievable. This was Millbrook, one big uptight piece of constipation. After all this. Well, uh, physically I was ill, so that I couldn't party as much. As, uh, and uh, I, I came down, and there's photographic evidence that Tom Wolfe was full of shit, because there I was grinning my ass off, is, is, is that a bad metaphor? On the bus, with good old Dean Moriarty. <laughs> Tom Wolfe's perspectives on life are very different from mine. I honor that difference, but uh, he judges me through his own lenses. That's fine, he can do that. We drove beneath the ivy and through the rocks and down the stately pavement to this wonderful house and when we got there we realized that we were the last things they were expecting and probably the worst things they were expecting i was up uh, sleeping and looked out and there came this bus outrageous cartoons and uh and they had blown a lot of minds in the midwest and <laughs> in oklahoma as they went through and uh, Tim thought it was all great fun. He loved it. Took us swimming down there in the little river with the waterfall. Spliced water all over us, cooled us down. The pond was a nice little beautiful flowing stream going over a nice little dam. And we sat there and the water flowed over us and it was beautiful, beautiful. The sun was glistening off beautiful young bodies. We climbed up out of the water and found that we were all covered with leeches. <laughs> Both acid tribes united that day in contrast. The prankster's wild fun and Millbrook's soulful meditation. Uh, we were influenced by European philosophy. 
Aldous Huxley and Gerald Hurd, and wow, we were awed, and uh, Alan Watts, on and on. <clears throat> and Milbrook were wall-to-wall gurus, you know. So uh, it was a much more uh, middle-aged, middle-class approach. They were getting high and fucking a lot. I hate to tell you this, but that's what they were doing. <laughs> In Leary's autobiography, Flashbacks, he wrote that when the day finally ended, Ken Kesey, Ken Babs, and I did meet, quietly in my room. We looked each other in the eye and promised to stay in touch as allies. And we have to this day. At the end of the 1960s, the great psychedelic revolution seemed to quiet down, and many people wondered what had happened to its revolutionary icons. The Merry Pranksters bus found rest at Ken Kesey's farm outside Eugene, Oregon. And Timothy Leary was sent to prison. I'm in prison now because uh, one evening I was in a parked car and a policeman came up to the car and opened the door against my wishes, and made a pass at the ashtray and said, you're under arrest for, uh, sort of for what? He said, for marijuana. I said, what marijuana? He reached in his pocket, he pulled out uh, two joints that I'd never seen before, half joints, and uh, said, you're under arrest. After Leary was released in 1973, he moved to California and settled in the hills overlooking Los Angeles. Here he devoted the next 20 years to studying and promoting computers and cyberculture. In 1995, Timothy Leary learned that he had developed terminal cancer. The man who inspired the exploration of spiritual existence was now nearing the end of physical existence. But Leary looked forward to dying. This was his chance to move to a new level of consciousness, the last and ultimate trip. The time came for friends and colleagues to say goodbye. Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters knew the bus had to roll again to go on one last psychedelic adventure with their old friend. This journey three decades after their meeting at Millbrook would take them to a new psychedelic retreat, a commune north of San Francisco, founded by Wavy Gravy, a place known as the Hog Farm. two psychedelic gurus were reunited. <laughs> Timothy Leary. Ken Kesey. Together again, to go further. How'd you sleep? Long and hard. I'll tell you, I, I take a drug. I take Excedrin PM, man. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Don't let your kids have it. <laughs> I invite you all to come have a cup of coffee, because uh, caffeine and nicotine. While Leary went for breakfast, the other merry pranksters that made the trip began their preparation for the upcoming show. George Walker, the chief prankster mechanic, worked out a few kinks with the bus. We're looking to replace the bolts that fell out of the exhaust manifold. And yeah, it's the same bus, it's just a different chassis and a different body, but it's the same bus, you know. it's. Keezy and Babs and me and Hagen and it's an international bus with paint all over it and everywhere we go people react in all kinds of fantastic ways and it's what we do. We drive the bus around. Also Mike Hagen 
who filmed the original prankster bus trip in 1964. If that video well, then it would have been a whole different thing. We would have recorded it really instead of having to, you know, go through the uh, old age process of rewinds and sound and sync chords. And Wavy Gravy, founder of the legendary commune, The Hog Farm, where the festival and reunion was taking place. And, of course, my dad, Ken Babs. Bathroom was... I didn't know you were up, man. I thought you were still knee bobs, country bread knee bobs. I love that. Knee bobbers, knee baba. I'm gonna get it with bacon, okay? Two eggs, potatoes, and toast with bacon. (coughs) Oh, thank you. What is this? Milk, cream, or milk? (laughs) All that lactose. I love lactose. Lactose. You ever sniffed it? No, I haven't had a chance to uh, sniff it. I haven't had it in the powder form yet. The non-dairy. I've Don't tried knock that. it till you tried it. further bus from the 1960s, the Merry Pranksters. Um, almost the entire original crew is here. We're heading south on the 101 freeway and we're going into Laytonville for the annual 1995 Hog Farm picnic. a movement for people to, to realize they can be free and be people who they want to be. What exactly is going on here? Well, uh, we're waiting for the hog farm party to start. He's like he's like uh, the Beatles, like Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. What did he do, though? How did he get so popular? How did he get so popular? I guess he used to just do his little tests. Yeah, what kind of tests? His acid tests. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody started learning how to live life. What's the, uh, what, what is the whole point of the picnic? Just, just, just a gathering of the tribes. 
Get as high as you possibly can. What do you know about Timothy Leary? Uh, a lot of it's just what? LSD. Oh, what did he do with LSD? A lot of studies with uh -huh. it and experimented himself with it a lot. He is sort of a shaman who taught me things very early in life. I, that's why I wanted to talk to the Keezy in here to get the whole story because I never even knew. I don't read books. I just know from like... Read? No, I mean, I, I read, but the most things I ever read is like high times, butt of the month, you know? Yeah. That's about it. Are, are you not? Everyone welcome Dr. Timothy Lee! This is another warrior. A great, great damn warrior for a long, long time. 30 years of fighting and then some. He's been there and he's been upbeat about it every step of the way. Well, there's a Moody Blue song that Timothy Larry did. No, no. I'm on the outside looking in. <laughs> I'm going to be accelerating out pretty soon. Maybe two years, maybe five years, maybe 55 years. She's but, uh, yeah, but what I'm doing is I'm living every day as though I were the last. And it's getting better and better and better. And this is a climax. We're so happy to be here. Thank you. We love you. Here's a poet shooting off a cannon. Yeah, right. <laughs> Can you get your helmet on over that bath? I tried. As the show went on, the Merry Pranksters dressed up in crazy costumes and prepared a final tribute performance for Dr. Timothy Leary. For Keezy and Leary, this reunion was not much different than the B-Ins, the Trips Festivals, and the Acid Tests of the 1960s. The generation has changed, but the faces have not. Uh, the great thing is uh, that every single person you see here, their eyes are smiling. I know. Their eyes are smiling. Uh, and they have wrinkles here. You can't or you have to earn those smile wrinkles. wrinkles. You can't just like order a, a smile wrinkles from your plastic surgeon. You have to earn. I actually did see some kids that were as young as 15 with smile wrinkles around their eyes. That young, smiling that hard. It's nice. You know, they were conceived uh, on the full moon with a proper uh, sacrament. That's right. <laughs> I've run in lots of enlightened people. There are diamond does. No, but a warrior. A warrior is different. A warrior is something doing something that doesn't quite make sense. Ken Kesey is on a riff now, warrior, 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 which is great. And uh, so uh, that was his trip, and I went along with it. I mean, look at Larry. He's, he's full of enthusiasm and emotion, and, and he's got maybe a week. We didn't know if he'd get this far. That's the truth. Coincidentally, the reunion of Larry and Kesey took place just two weeks after Jerry Garcia died. Jerry's passing was still fresh in everyone's minds and hearts, especially at the hog farm. This is a warrior.
warrior we're talking about. Rock and rollers are a dime a dozen. Guitar players are a dime a dozen. This is a warrior. Garcia has been fighting the battle for our souls and our hearts and our minds for 30 fucking years. This is a warrior. And the war is not over just because one of the generals happens to fall in battle. He would be very hurt if he thought that we were going to stop what we were doing just because he had died. You know, a lot of people don't get appreciated until they're gone. And, and I think that Jerry was appreciated in his lifetime, no doubt about it. Uh, almost too much. <laughs> he was overappreciated. And maybe uh, if he was not so revered and so much was expected of him, perhaps he would have avoided this pitfall. Jerry was uh, a very intellectual, thought-minded person. That's one thing about his music that's so interesting is that it, there's so much thought in it. It's so deep. Uh, it's so deep that I think most deadheads may not even <laughs> be aware of how deep it is. Well, I love him. I think he's one of the greatest people we've known yeah. in the century. I got dozens of reporters saying, well, this means the end of an era, doesn't it? Well, it's just uh. the beginning. <laughs> Philosophers have run into this basic human taboo mystery. What happens after you die? Uh, technically, you're in exactly the state that the Buddhists say you should get into, of uh, d detachment. You're, there's no more uh, body anymore. Forget the body. But the brain, boom, is fantastic. You know, everybody always mourns and mopes about death, which Timothy sees it as just another great trip, you know, move on to the next level and uh, take the great one-way one -way journey. You know, he's got a one-way ticket coming up to someplace else, and he knows that, and is excited about it. He's looking forward to the journey with uh, great anticipation and no fear. It, it's the last taboo, death, and it's going to crumble, because the most important, maybe one of the most important things you do in your life is die. How are you going to do it? I've been planning it, thinking about it, and uh, learning about the possibilities for like 20 years in general, but in the last, since January, when I found out I got my terminal notice, prostate cancer. <laughs> and now I'm really thinking about it a lot. What Leary is doing, as uh, has shown in almost all of his life, is he's finding the edge of the envelope, and he's pushing it a little bit. And he has made the hole to light a little bit larger with every damn year that's passed. The more you know him, you, the more you realize this guy is an enlightened man uh, and as far out as psychedelics get, and yet he's completely traditional uh, man who is, who is believed in his spirituality. It just doesn't have a label on it, but nobody can doubt the fact that it's going on when you look into those strange little Irish eyes and hear the Blarney spoon teak out of your heart. Part of the key to getting anything real done is sticking with it. And Tim has certainly stuck with it over, over the years. So, I mean, he has not deviated from his deviations. And uh, each religion has got their own uh, way of making you feel like a victim. The Christians say you're our original sin and you better the way to just zip up your trousers and give the money to the Pope and uh, we'll give you a, a room up in the, uh, the uh, hotel in the sky. Well, I know where we go when we die, but it's nothing to be worried about. It's no big thing. It's like puberty. It's like uh, being 
hit in the head with a ball bat. It's going to happen. The idea is, are you going to enjoy it? As Timothy Leary neared the end of his life, he commented that he was lucky enough to ride the waves of four great cultural revolutions. Jazz, acid, punk, and cyberspace. Timothy was fascinated with computers. Like LSD, he believed computers are tools for behavioral change, communication, and enlightenment. Right now, uh, it's happening, but in 10 years, it'll be commonly accepted that every school room will have a, uh, a uh, web connection. During the last few years of his life, Leary became deeply involved with the Internet and the World Wide Web. He called the Internet the LSD of the 90s. Through his homepage, Leary.com, he bid farewell to his longtime fans and followers in cyberspace. Leary remarked that he wanted to die on the Internet. This comment led the media and the public to believe that he was going to commit suicide, live, online, for the world to watch. On May 10th, 1996, 20 days before Leary died, he invited Ken Kesey to join him in an internet video conference to say their final goodbyes. The press immediately began a rumor that this was the event where Leary would commit suicide. Kesey and Leary planned their final meeting in a place more fantastic than Millbrook or the Hog Farm, on a new plane of existence, a place their wildest trips in the 60s never imagined, a final reunion in cyberspace. <laughs> hey, now, that's, that's, that's great, isn't it? There we go. Oh, How about nice that? Isn't that great? Yeah. It's nice. We'll sit at the table. And yeah, isn't that great? For a while. Let's party a little, huh? Let's do it. Yeah. If Tim Larry dying on the internet mm-hmm. brings audience, they'll be right after it. That's the pollution factor there. Mm-hmm. Is people have seen just about everything else. Mm-hmm. The last time I saw him, uh, we were leaving. There was a lot of press there, and they all want to know what happened to the 60s. What happened to the 60s? And the 60s ain't over until the fat lady gets high. Now, everybody wants to avoid this issue, but talking about Tim Leary without talking about drugs is like talking about downhill skiing without dealing with snow. It's what the thing rides on. Leary knows enough about chemicals and uh, life and death that he really is ready to move on, as ready as anybody I've ever seen, ready to move. You have to admire the guy. Here's a guy who uh, uh, a lot of people would put in a nursing home and he's at home in his own house, and not only that, but still working, and he's going to go out on his own terms. He's not going to go out on somebody else's telling him how he's going to go. People want to always try to end pain, but not their lives. And if in the course of ending the pain you happen to die, that's not suicide. That's just uh, tending to the wound, and sometimes you die during it. We're bringing Tim over right now. Get right up on close, Tim. Via internet. <laughs> Are you there yet? Can you hear us? It's Tim Larry. We see you, Tim. I think. Where's my glasses? That's him. You're moving very slow. Oh, you're moving very slow, Tim. I'll fuck him up, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Tim, this is Babs. And this is Keezy. I'm glad we lined up and hooked up with you, man. I know. Listen, we're traveling through uh, spaghetti in the sky. Well, we're, you're, we're doing it again. Yes, yes, we see each other again. The same old fuck up, the same old trouble with the pasta, but we're coming through. Yes. Well, it's a very, very beautiful day. And we're in, a, we're in a Kesey mood, and we're ready to go further and further. You know, isn't this an amazing thing, Tim? You remember when we talked about this maybe 15 years ago? That everybody's going to have the capacity to be in everybody's ear before uh, long, and we're just about there. I remember it, it, these seemed like wild dreams then, and it's just happening so fast. And Yeah, you know, all of this stuff has gone out... Uh, to the newspaper in a way that uh, 
all of our stuff has always found places in the press. Uh, it, it's because it, it's seeking another audience out there. All this equipment is allowing us to get out of, from under the thumb of the major uh, broadcasting companies and build our own audience. Yeah, and empowering the 10-year-old kid. The 10-year-old kid has got the equipment of a network now. It's thrilling. The world's looking. But uh, it's strange the reaction this has caused him. I've caught a lot of shit about this stuff. Uh, and, you know, like, we've been talking about this a long time, but what the press wants to hear is the word suicide. You know what? If, if the individual has this option, exercise the option, to make this decision, then everything follows from that. Uh, rehearse your dying. Practice your dying. Do it with friends. And, of course, you'll be doing the same thing with your living. Practice living and practice dying. Yeah, everybody's been asking me, is he going to do it this day? I said, I don't know. But I know if he said that he was, you couldn't take that because there's enough Irishman and prankster and blarney in Tim Leary that you're never quite sure if you got him cornered. <laughs> uh, Tim, I bought this little bottle of old bush males here. Um, hoping to get it down to you, we, we could drink it, but there's only about a half inch left in it. All right, that's a great grain drink, man. That's health food. <laughs> that's health food. Man. Irish whiskey is the best whiskey in the world. All right, well. Makes you want to sing and bomb the English. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> further, further, further. <laughs> I salute you and your, and your partners. You're the greatest guys around. Ken, uh, you have enriched my life, and I take my hat off to you once again, my brother and my pal. Keep it going, brother. Keep it going. <laughs> did you hear me? I did hear you, Tim. And, you know, one of the things that I will regret if it doesn't happen is to, um, to do a trip with you. Yeah. We may zoom down here, and, and, and I'll help you on your way. <laughs> and we will get it on and high, high, high. How's that? Here we go. I'm going to go down and get the whiskey and the tequila, and we're going to play music where you can. Take care, brother. Stay in line. Okay, man. When Irish eyes are smiling, sure, it takes your breath away. Especially when you drink bush meals in the middle of the day. Take it easy, you guys. I'm going to be with you, man. Okay, we see you too, Tim. See you down the line. Stay in touch. Good night, my brother. I say to you, good night. Don't you wear your frown on your midnight flight. I love you, and I bid you good night, good night, good night. Coming down the